Welcome to the Essien Scrum Podcast. I am Rafael Lecto, the editor of the Essien Forum website, and joining me today is Randall Plunkett, the 21st Baron of Tansaini. Thank you a lot for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, Randall, you, I know that your father was also an artist, and your great-grandfather was very fa- not just a famous author, but he was also quite a pioneer in terms of... Um, creating world building at that scale so i imagine that being raised in such an environment with like your parents and um, the looming figure of your your great grandfather always in the background um, do you think this this environment fostered like your interest in um, in creativity world building since, since now you are a filmmaker absolutely um it was a bit scary at the beginning because when you have such um when you have like grandparents and great grandparents who have like that much under their belt in terms of achievements, <laughs> it's, it's really hard. There's a lot of pressure to kind of like, are you going to be like that, that no talented nephew who can't or, or, or grandson who, who never could repeat the success. But uh, no, you know, at first I kind of resisted a little bit, kind of trying to reject all my, my, uh, my great grandfathers and my father's kind of like style and said, I was going to do my own thing. But you know, as time goes on, I've, I've been inspired by the same things. And, and you know, I find that their work uh, really helps complement my own. So it's, it's been, it was really important because by being exposed to that level of um, culture as well, it does open up a lot of doors in terms of your imagination. Um, of course, it's different because, like I said, I come from a traditional family and there's a lot of art and history and things like that here. But I've always been really fascinated by the subversive culture, you know, the alternative scene, uh, noir art, all that kind of stuff, comics, all these kinds of things that are very much of my time and not so much of my great grandfather's time and my father's time. That's that's very interesting. So can you um, can you detail a little bit more of those um, that more subculture side? Like, how did you start to get interested in, in this kind of stuff? So I think if I go way, way back way back to when I was a guy running around in diapers, the Ninja Turtles, Mm. right? Now, let me, me, before you, I know you're you're thinking, what, what, what are you talking? When I was a kid, I grew up up in America, right? And and it was the eighties and Ninja Turtles was like the big program when you were like five, right? And I remember the coolest thing I ever seen was when I got my VHS tape of the Ninja Turtles cartoon and there was, uh, rock steady and and bebop and the one with the mohawk mm. i saw i'd never seen a mohawk before and i thought that was so cool i wanted a mohawk and i i was like four or five at this time right but so that was i think if i had to like that was probably the first time where it was like right okay if boy at five wants a mohawk i'm doomed from the start i'm gonna be into this stuff and then you know when i was about seven or eight years old um I got heard the first band I ever really got into because, you know, people had listened to music and it was all that uh, that rubbish that was in the 80s and stuff. But then I heard one of the most important albums ever, and it was called Power Slave by Iron Maiden. <laughs> so that's and it was on a tape. And that's where it started. And I never heard guitar playing like that before. I mean, how could I? I was like seven or eight. Uh, they, they were, you know, and most people back then were, you know, they like pop music. I mean, it was Michael Jackson, right? And uh, but no, for me it was Iron Maiden, and then very soon after that, uh, it was Morbid Angel, and um, and a couple of other bands because I I grew up at a time where in Ireland, the heavy metal scene was not so so mixed. You know, I mean, it was not so separated, and it was the early part of the '90s, and they were putting out. Uh, they had a radio station that a few hours a week they would put music, and I remember hearing Morbid Angel, Cannibal Corpse. Sepultura and you know from Iron Maiden to Sepultura is quite a jump yeah. and I remember saying like these bands have all the stuff I like about Iron Maiden and they got more there's more dark more extreme and then like you know Cannibal Corpse I mean that was the most brutal thing I ever heard and I I love the whole as- aspect of the of the blood and the gore because you know I was a kid so it was like you know all these guts and all this you know cool stuff and I was like I looked at all the, the album covers and I was like you know, and that's what it is. And like I said, it was from from that time. There was no internet, so you would buy. I started buying albums, and I discovered like death metal and stuff like that. So, and the album covers were crazy. So, I started getting uh, all buying albums just for the covers. And 
most of them thankfully at that time were pretty good but there were a couple of there were a couple of shitty ones too so <laughs> there was more cover than benefit well that's um it's funny because marvy Daniel is also one of the the first bands that i started to like you know on the the more extreme side of the spectrum yeah it's really um so like a, a a whole new world that it opens up and um yeah just out of curiosity um what would be your favorites right now in that style well, you see, i have i have like what i call is my favorites that are my all-time favorites hmm. which are bands that never change you know uh, and they would be bands like neurosis uh hmm. i love uh, a band called typo negative that was like one of my young young love them uh, as well. loves you know I, i i really still love uh very early sepultura is still for me one of the best things you know thrash bands uh i loved um You know, I loved a lot of hardcore as well. So there was a lot of, there were bands like Marauder and Earth Crisis that I was really into. And then I liked Sludge. So things like Crowbar and things like that, you know, misery music, basically. And, um, you know, and then of course, like the, the more mainstream stuff like Pantera, because that's still got some great grooves. And I love, you know, I hear a great Southern trend kill and, you know, it makes me want to smoke some weed and, 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 uh, and drink whiskey. And then like, you know, those are albums that, you know, it was 1995 when I was listening to all that stuff. So for me, like that, I remember that when it was coming out and it shows my age. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we all have the, a couple of, a few albums that really stuck with us like forever. The, yeah. But I'm also interested in terms of more recent releases, has there been anything that has caught your attention, like in particular from recent years? Yeah, there's, there's constantly stuff. So I, I like I go to Roadburn Festival every year. Uh, I don't know if you know what where Roadburn is. It's in it's in the Netherlands, right? I don't know. Uh, um, never been there, but it's one of those trips that I really want to make. So for day. me, Roadburn is my perfect festival, right? Because not only does it have like it really interesting artists and artists that you wouldn't normally see. Because I live in Ireland, so we we like a certain kind of stuff. We it, we like doom. We like traditional death metal. But you know, you're not gonna see typical like really avant-garde style or, or very extreme black metal there. Um, where at Roadburn, you will see cool bands and they will play stuff that you wouldn't normally hear. Like they'll play their first album from start to finish. So uh, Roadburn tends to be a thing. So, so you know, I kind of, um, so when I, when, I, when I go to Roadburn, that's the kind of music that I really, I really like. So in terms of new bands, there's one band, um, I mean, There's a lot of black metal these days because what I've noticed is uh, I was the death metal scene has quietened down a little bit, and there's a lot of bands like like Death Spell Omega and uh, Regard Le Tombe de Um. I think I said that right. I probably butchered that to anyone who's listened to this in France. I apologize. <laughs> um, and uh, and th those kinds of like black metal bands, but I also like bands like The Body. I don't know if you've heard of The Body. I don't think so. It's sort of mm. ambient noise, and they do a lot oh, of uh, collides. Like so they, it, but it's more than that. It's it's a lot. They use a lot. Of, they sometimes get female vocals, and they sample all this abrasive electronic stuff. You know, Author and Punisher is another one that I think is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I love Cult of Luna. Like mm -hmm. Cult of Luna is a big one for me. Like one of my favorite bands, and is is a uh, is uh, well, one of my favorite artists is actually uh, Justin Broderick who is in Yezu and Godflesh. Godflesh. And in fact, yeah. interesting enough, because I'm a filmmaker, my last film, The Green Sea, originally we had Justin to do the music. And unfortunately oh. for scheduling reasons, he couldn't finish, like the movie got delayed. And as a result, he couldn't commit to the project. So we unfortunately had to replace him, but it would have been so cool to have Justin, yeah. the yeah, God very, Broderick, very who precise. especially his band Yezu for me is one of the best like ambient stuff because when I when I create because I'm a writer as well a lot of the time so I will typically get a handful of albums and I will write a piece of work with a selection of albums and and Yezu is is one of the one bands that's really good to write to because it's it's not too um all over the place and it kind of creates those tones of euphoria which I really like especially when creating because my stuff tends to be smaller budget so it tends to be more like I go for visuals And those kind of bands lean a lot to the visuals. Um, but yeah, so in fact, funny enough, uh, even an, on another front, because we, we originally were talking to Justin and there was another one called Scott Connor of a band called Zather. Mm -hmm. So myself and Scott, uh, I don't know if you know, know Zather. Yeah, I've heard of it. 
he's a one man one man black metal outfit or at least he used to be and now he does doom grass and myself and scott got friendly and we might even still be working with together on the next next film which would be really cool and he does uh, that kind of like depressive doom grass so that's kind of like a new a new genre i don't think there's too many people doing that well that sounds very very interesting very promising the, I think yeah. it's, it's very interesting that you bought up Roadburn because you know, before we started the interview, I was telling you about the Essien firm. And it's yeah. very interesting because the the type of the aesthetic realm that we cover is very similar to, to, to the crossing that happens at Roadburn, right? The, yeah. the more alternative, the more underground metal, but also, you know, this psychedelic stuff and um, folk music, like uh, weird dark folk music or ambient noise, whatever. You know, that's also, it coincides also with our palette, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, you know, th that's what's so important about, about uh, people like yourself and Roadburn, because there, there would be no chance for me to ever hear some of the bands that I'm most passionate about, because it's not stuff that, you know, I live on an, I live in Ireland, which is a small t a country. We don't have a huge metal scene and the metal people who are in Ireland, they like, like I said, certain kinds of stuff, you know, if it's entombed or my dying bride, they'll sell tickets here, but you're never gonna, they're never going to sell tickets to Merzbau. You know what I mean? They're never going to like, yeah. you know, uh, it's those kinds of bands or, or you know, like, um, you know, these come on avant garde kind of jazzy things. I mean, those things are not easy to sell here. And if they do come here, it's by accident, <laughs> you know. So it, so for me and being able to hear bands like that in a big stage that has that is very much a music festival, not just to sell tickets and sell beer, but, you know, audio fans, people who love music a lot go to Roadburn. And that's why for me, it's not just like whacking where everybody's just partying all the time. It's it's about the music there. And that's for me is really important because for me, I mean, I would have loved to be a musician, but I have no musical talent. So I make films instead. And so I would say that if I was if if films were 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 uh were music, I guess I would say I, I try to be somewhere in between like, you know, I try and go on the avant-garde style. So I guess if there was a, a film festival like Roadburn, I'd be there trying to make movies for that well yeah that's um that's interesting indeed like when you talk about um, the, the internet I, I think eventually i think it's um it's a double-edged sword because like you said uh, earlier the um, there was also there was a lot of good stuff in the um, back in the day there, there was also a lot of shitty uh, releases and the internet also amplifies that you know there's there's simply too much uh there's a no board charge of uh, stimulation of uh, bands and it, it's a bit on one hand it, it really exposes you to stuff that maybe you would have never found otherwise but it also it's a bit hard you need to be selective in order to pick the the good from the bad right you know i was kind of laughing about this a little bit the other day because when i was young you know i used to not eat food at school because you know my parents would give me money my pot my money for my lunch yeah and, uh, you know, my parents worked, you know, I mean, a lot of people think that it's uh, when you live in a castle, you just got lots of money. But most of the time it's it's we have a big house, but it's, you know, it's the the scale of everything is big. So I used to get my lunch money and, and I used to get it was back in the 90s. So I got I got 15 pounds, which is you know roughly about 15, 20 euros a week. Right. Which was great. And that had to pay for my lunch. And I got five euros for pocket money. Right. Now, at that time, it, it cost roughly about 15 pounds for a CD, a new CD, right? Mm. So I figured that if I don't eat, I could buy a CD a week, <laughs> right? And I mean, that was, but that's what I did. So from the age of about nine, that's what I did. I just didn't eat any food. Like I'd wait till I got home and I'd, I'd like stuff myself full of, <laughs> full of potato chips and stuff like that, trying to like, so I could afford to buy a CD a week, right? And um and this was the most amazing thing because, you know, you could you could only afford like maybe one or two. And I didn't drive. So even I lived in the country, couldn't get to this. So I'd save up all my money and then I'd be allowed to go to Dublin maybe once or twice a month. And I'd go there and I'd buy like two albums, you know. And so I had to make those albums count because it's hard work and I didn't work. So um, and I starved plenty. I got very thin, but at least I was able to walk away with great albums. Now, like I said, there wasn't that many people that sold that kind of stuff. So I had to find, I found this special little shop that's in a basement in Dublin called the Sound Cellar. And I mean, it's been there for like since the seventies and that was the the metal place. They had everything from like, you know, Burzum, Emperor to like, you know, Spine Shank and Corn and like then Green Day. <laughs> like it was just everything. 
and everything in between. Like it was, it was such an unusual place because it wasn't like a, it was like, yeah, I know there wasn't like that. It was, there was no Virgin or, or HMV that was like that. It was just pure solid music. And like I said, there was no variations. It was like, we only had alternative music and the normal music. So, you know, I didn't really see a lot of the separation lines between, you know, I, I listened to punk. I was, I loved punk for a while. You know, I was, had my rancid albums and my, my, you know, exploited albums. And then, you know, I had some of that new metal stuff as well. That was totally fine. It was bouncy. And then like, you know, the stuff I really liked, which was just, you know, the, the stuff behind the counter, you know? <laughs> yeah. And there was usually like blood and guts on the title and, it, and you couldn't read, you couldn't read the goddamn title. Yeah. So I had to sit there and kind of like, Oh, that's the, uh, and the guy would say, yeah, it's, it's the, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, the most obscure black metal or death metal bands, but you know, and uh, you know, and I remember, I remember the first day I bought uh, "Killing on Adrenaline" by Dying Fetus, and that was so good. I never heard anything like that before. I don't know if you know that album. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah it's quite quite a story. <laughs> so I want I wanted to go back to something that you said that I found very interesting, which is when you were talking about having a traditional family but also these more subculture sites so I think it's interesting that you uh, you you were and still are in touch with both the let's say the I heart and the more like popular art so to speak so um do you think that's that type of um synthesis like that eclecticism still is still something that uh, shows up like in your movies or or anywhere else De definitely because you know it comes from inspiration right because I mean Music is music. I mean, you get what you get from music. It touches you in a certain way. I was always really interested in, in that darker thing, but it's the same with my movies as well. I was the movie, my favorite movies were movies that always had a darker nature or had like a more, a more deeper meaning behind them. So either they were art house movies that were very obscure, that were dealt with kind of unusual themes. Um, and much like the music that I listened to, it, it just, it just, all of my interests just seem to fit in these unusual kinds of things i love the surreal and and it, that's why it's so it's not surprising that i was so drawn towards things like ambience and things like that as well um and yet at the same time i was surrounded by you know great ancient paintings that you know from from my relatives because we, i live in a, in a very old 900 year old castle and my family has you know it's like a museum you know you've got paintings you've got all these ancient books and you're seeing like Italian style paintings of, of, uh, of religious uh, battles and stuff like that and half naked people like killing each other. And then, you know, those, so I'm surrounded by the, what I, yeah, as you say, the, the, the classic art. And yet I'm sort of drawn towards this sort of, I would say more um, unusual kind of music and culture, but that's a thing of our time. And I, I sort of think to myself, is it, is it, is it because there's, uh, am I the one that's different or is it just our time is different? And that in, in 100 years, all the stuff that we're into today is going to be very much like, like what these Italian paintings are like. It was just, oh, but that's a thing of the time. It was a style. You know? And those, those themes um, are very much, they, they're food for thought for me because you know, these darker themes, serial killers, uh, you know, fight against, against society and, and all these themes that are so current to our generation today, um, it really adds a lot to what you, what, how you feel as a person and in terms of what, I write what I know. So the inadequacies that I, and, and inadequacies, the inadequacies that I feel today, I, I, I get very much those, those tones and feels are embedded in my work. So like I said, I work listening to this music. So the meanings, the tones, the the ideas are 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 they're having a uh, if you like they're having an effect on the way I think, and as a result, those the way I think gets embedded into the work. So it's it's very much it one that complements the other, and that's what I think is very interesting. And you don't see a lot of people in our um, in my industry who are interested in this kind of culture which means that there isn't really that, it's not representative in the visual medium as much. And that's a problem. And if you do, it tends to be a caricature. It tends to be like, oh, we'll just do a WWE movie and we'll throw in Kill Switch and Gage in the soundtrack. That's, it's not the same thing, you know what I mean? But people who are doing, and that's why I find music is so interesting because music is, is 
people can express themselves without really being hindered. With film, it's a bit more complicated because there's so many people involved with film um, that you get a lot of melting pot <clears throat> of, of ideas coming together. And it's, it's fundamental that a director or creator, writer, whatever, has a very sharp view of what they're trying to express so it doesn't get tainted too much by, by the others. Um, it's a little bit easier with music because there's less people involved, I think. And nowadays, probably it's even easier now again because most people can make music in their bedroom and they don't even need a band anymore. Well, indeed, music and in particular, the type of music that we've been discussing, like, you know, punk and heavy metal, you know, it's very um, cathartic music and it has this reputation yeah. of being, although music in general, I would say, is, is very direct. It's a very direct medium where, indeed, with cinema, uh, like you said, with so many, all those aspects, not just the, the number of people, but the, all those, the production, the um, financing and the um, promotion, uh, it really sounds like um, a very almost a painful process in the sense that in order to get your idea exactly as you want it you need to go through a lot of uh, a lot of work to really to really make it come out uh, as you envisioned it yeah and and you know it's 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 really tricky because um you know the unlike music where you know there's a there's a big market for music in in different categories i mean you know i'm sure that that Merzbau doesn't sell a lot of albums in terms of like, you know, I'm sure he's not massively rich, but there is people who like that. There are people who like grindcore. You know, again, you won't be buying a, 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 a chateau in France with your money, but you are probably going to be able to, to build a career as a touring and doing things like that, probably. But with film, because just to make a small amount of film costs so much money, and the money that you get back, it's, it's much the same as music. When you, when you put out an album, you know, people may buy your album, fair enough. Nowadays, they don't even do that. They just listen to it on yeah. Spotify, right? But so you're getting like one penny, less than a penny on Spotify, and maybe the same with Tidal and, and all the other ones that there are. But it's a cumulative. You might listen to the same album over and over again. It might be in your car or whatever. But with a movie, that doesn't happen because, you know, you go on Netflix or something like that. You click on it. You, chances are you're going to watch the movie once. Most people will watch a movie once, maybe in a few years later, you watch it again. But to continuously watch stuff, it's very difficult. So the money is, the margins of money are smaller, the expenses are higher, and there's more people involved. And worse yet, people don't want to watch, like nobody is going to watch the, the uh, film equivalent of Pig Destroyer. This <laughs> is not going to happen. And if they are, you are going to have to make a movie for really cheap because the, the thing is that the, the area of people who are going to watch a movie like on, on that level of extremity and watch it in the language with that, because again, the problem is Germans don't want to uh, read subtitles. The French don't like reading subtitles. The Spanish definitely don't like reading subtitles in Americans. Portugal. Americans, exactly. But in Portugal, they do actually read subtitles because, uh, you know, I'm half Brazilian. So I speak Portuguese and I was really impressed when I went to Portugal, everybody, everybody still reads the subtitles. But aside from Portugal and yeah. Holland, everybody else wants dubbing, which means that's another huge amount of money put into the film for like a small market. With music, you don't have that. You know, people will listen to, to, to music. I mean, look at Rammstein. People listen to Rammstein. Nobody knows what that guy is saying. Uh, and even German people probably roll their eyes and go, he's saying nothing. You know what I mean? But, um, but that's the problem with film. So, we are we are squashed by the industry itself so much more because we are so in needing of it. And even if you, unlike with music, even if you put out, you you make a band, you're going to go completely independent. You're going to put your stuff on Spotify. You'll sell T-shirts on Bandcamp. Unlike, you can't really do that with film because there is no merchandising really unless you make, you know, the kind of movie that people want to have merch, which basically means horror. Uh, so you're not going to, like, unless you make a horror... You can't. And then again, like I said, if you're trying to sell your movie to a network, they want a 90 minute movie. Um, they want stars. Well, if you can't afford stars, that's going to be tricky. If you, if then you've got to be less category of money. And then, like I said, you're, it's hard because there's the opportunities to show your movie are still limited by gatekeepers where it's not so much like that as much in the music industry, because nowadays anyone can put out stuff on Bandcamp. Anyone can do stuff on soundcloud or spot uh, or um youtube or whatever in fact there's whole there's there's a label what are they called not not tracked or whatever i got them 
all their stuff is on YouTube. You know, you're never going to get it. They sell tapes, some of these bands. And I mean, I don't have a tape player. I, I'm from the, I'm from the present. I'm not going back in the past. I'm not going to buy a tape player. Excuse me. You can sell me vinyl. You can sell me CDs. You're not selling me tapes. That's taking the piss. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Plus, where does one even buy a tape player in 2021? And it's also a lot of uh, retro mania uh, recently. You know, even even vinyl, which is um, it's more available, but there's also uh, part of why it's so popular. It's also that um, that nostalgia for the past as well. Yeah, you see, I, I'm a bit of a weird one because like I got I never had vinyl growing up because my family never had vinyl. We had tapes and we had CDs. Mm -hmm. So when I had enough money to save up and buy a, a CD player, it was the greatest moment of my life because <laughs> I could skip tracks. I didn't have to have those long intros anymore. You know, it was great. And the thing is, is that the sound quality was so good, or at least it was for me. Now, I'm a hi-fi guy. I don't know if you can see in the background. Just show you there. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm a guy who's into boxes. You know what I mean? Like, I have a lot of boxes and speakers, and I play with wires and stuff to get the best sound. And, you know, the ironic thing is I listen to Norwegian black metal, which means, you know, it was sounded like shit in the first place. So even if I have all this expensive equipment, it's still going to sound like shit. But I love it. That's that's my you know, I'm a big kid. And I still walk around with heavy metal T-shirts and nearly the age of 40. And I'm never going to change. Um, but the thing is, is that when the CD came out, it was perfect for me. It was cheap. It was it sounds perfect every time. And then vinyl came and I was like, I never heard really vinyl before. And I started writing this movie called The Green Sea, which is actually out now. And the, I, I wanted something kind of a romanticized uh, feel of a, someone who was in a band. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time when I was kind of writing it, I was kind of thinking like a lot of the people who I know who like vinyl were a certain kind of person. They were musicians, they were stuff like that. And I didn't know the first thing about vinyl. Didn't know how to put it on, didn't know how to clean it, anything, didn't have it. So I started studying and that's how I got into vinyl because I started doing research for my film that I was writing because I'm a, what they call a method writer. As in when I create an idea, I start living the idea as like I pretend, I won't say I pretend, but I pretend doing things that the character that I'm writing will do because the idea is if I start to familiarize myself with their world, I'm able to express how they would react better. That's how I do it. That's how I justify it. So, <clears throat> so what I started doing is I started buying vinyl, listening to it, and doing the whole process of cleaning the disc of, of the, the, the thing, putting it on the turntable, all that stuff. So I could kind of mimic that, that my character was doing in the movie. Now, the funny thing is in the movie, all that scenes got cut in by the end of the movie, but the idea of the character was, was learned. And so I, all I ended up was with, with a whole collection of vinyl and, and a turntable. Now I still love vinyl, but CDs are still my, still my baby. I still buy lots of CDs. And I'll, I'll buy the nice vinyl when I can, but uh, I'm not buying no tapes. <laughs> they got me there. They're not getting me there. Well, that's, uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, so now that we've, we've, talked, um, we've been talking about um, your work as a filmmaker uh, and as a screenwriter, um, could you talk about your, your journey there? Like, how did this come about? Um, how did you start to get interested in this medium? Um, what motivated you to actually make the leap, you know, from a fan to, to an actual um, writer and, uh, and director? So my dad uh, was an artist and my dad, we were living in America at the time. And uh, my parents had to work like every day to pay the bills and stuff. And it was very expensive. It was the 80s. And um, so I spent a lot of time at home alone with, with like a nanny. Um, or an au pair. And uh, the thing is, you know, we could sit there and watch TV and be vegetables. Or my dad started saying to me, you know, he tried to get me, because he was an artist, he tried to get me to draw, to, to tell stories, because that's his language. That was his, that's how he was able to express himself. And the thing is, with any artist, the most important thing about any uh, about people is the ability to express yourself. Now, some people express themselves through cooking. Some people express themselves through, I don't know, dancing. But for an artist, uh, in my dad's case anyway, he expressed himself through his work. So I suppose he tried to create a, a, a connection between me and him through enabling what he knew, which was his expression through art. So we used to draw together and he used to pay me and that's how he got me in to incentivized to it because we wanted sweets. So he'd give me a small amount of money if I drew a picture and he'd hire me to do it basically. So I started doing comics 
And in the comics, I had to tell stories, right? But of course, I, I told you I had listened to some heavy metal. So, you know, I had seen Crazy Eddie on all the Iron Maiden covers. <laughs> I had seen, uh, you know, the Cannibal Corpse albums and stuff like that. So I wanted, you know, Eddie murdering him and, and, you know, you know, massacring everybody on my pictures. And, and all my comic strips were really violent and super dark. And there was lots of shadows and guns and liquor and, and people getting beaten up. And, and, you know, there was no, and there was no, you know, uh, no limits to the amount of violence I can put in my pictures. Right. So it was, it was, yeah, sort of like a, a really hack version of a cannibal corpse uh, sleeve. But so I started drawing all these pictures and telling these like dark noirish stories, detectives, uh, murderers, uh, gangsters, you know, that was what I was really interested in. And he would pay me per, per drawing. So I told whole stories. That was the first step to me becoming a writer because that was at the age of six and seven. And then by the time, you know, I, uh, I got older, like, you know, it, it, that became how I expressed my myself, how I expressed my imagination. That, and he also was very keen um, to it, get me with cinema knowledge. So because I had to spend all my time at home, because it was too dangerous for kids to go outside and I lived in a busy part of New York um, and it was the eighties. So they were kidnapping and I was good for kidnapping. I was a cute little kid. They would have absolutely sold me into the sex trade like that. Right. So they had to keep me locked up. And uh, so what we were allowed to do, there was a, a, an Iranian man who used to live on the end of the street and he had a video shop. And so my, my dad would take me there and the video shop had like really good films. It wasn't just like mainstream stuff. They had loads of obscure art house films and my parents were a bit crazy. So instead of like, you know, I'm five years old, instead of showing me like, you know, Disney movies, they let me have the odd Disney movie, but my dad would say, okay, I could rent one Disney movie and I had to rent one art house film. So like, you know, I was watching Igmar Bergman at the age of seven and, you know, when I look back at that, I think my parents were absolutely insane. But the funny thing is, is that the more I watched all these like European films, you know, Fellini, like Igmar Bergman, like classic Hollywood films, you know, stuff with with uh, John Wayne and, 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 and Humphrey Bogart and then all these like British new wave films, stuff that like no kid would watch. Right. The more I watched those films, the more I got less and less interested in what was the mainstream. And I got I started finding really interesting stuff because. There was a, a filmmaker who I got really into, who I could never understand at the age of seven. And even today, I mean, it's hard to understand it, was a guy called Louis Bunuel. And there was another guy called Antonioni who did this film called Blow Up. Like these were the movies that I was watching when I was six. And like, I couldn't possibly understand the full capacity of what was going on, but I was really like into it. And then of course came the, the David Lynch's of this world and stuff like that. But that's that was my cinema education. That, so that started coming into my drawings and stuff like that. And then I was completely screwed because there was no chance of me not becoming a filmmaker after that. Yeah, I think yeah, it's very easy to, to see that for we, now that you talk about this background. So you already talked about uh, Buñuel, which I also like very much and, and Lynch and all those, but I'm interested in, um, can you out of all those movies that you were exposed to as a kid and later, uh, can you tell us what were the those that really stuck with you? Those that really became um, influential uh, later on. So, Blow Up definitely was one. I really loved um, this one. Um, so, so I was a big fan of uh, Nicholas Ray. I don't know if you know the the uh, Nicholas Ray. He did Rebel Without a Cause, and he did an, another one um, uh, with Humphrey Bogart. And it was called. Let me just get you get it for you here. Um, in a Lonely Place, that was it. Mm -hmm. So In a Lonely Place with Humphrey Bogart. And it's it's this really interesting, because you got to understand that I'm always looking for the dark side of the story, right? And um, the thing is with Nicholas Ray, I would argue that Nicholas Ray was one of the first filmmakers to really embody um, a, a psychosis in the younger generation, right? He was really focused on like people going mental. Uh, and particularly like having uh, psychological collapses. If you look at like Rebel Without a Cause, James Dean is a guy on the edge and, you know, his, he can't handle being himself and he's exploding and his, his, his aggressiveness is, is, is destroying the, the, the world around him. And in A Lonely Place, which was the one I actually loved the most, is Humphrey Bogart is a scriptwriter. So there's a connection there. And he's this sort of 
out of work script writer. He doesn't really want to do a job and he gets mixed up with a murder. And he's a very violent script writer. He has a real temperament that if he's pushed, he'll lose it and he'll absolutely attack people and get really violent. And he becomes suspicious. Well, he, the, the suspicion falls on him to be the, um, the criminal who murdered this girl. And as you think at the beginning of the movie, you think, oh, he's, he's innocent. Then you start to see that perhaps he could actually be guilty because he is quite violent and unhinged. And, you know, I won't spoil the ending, but it's, it's fantastic because it swaps these role reversals and this idea that you cannot, you're, you cannot exist within your own world because you're falling apart. So that was one of them. I really liked um, going back on Humphrey Bogart as well. I love a lot of that noirish stuff. Noir-ish stuff. So I loved um, the Maltese Falcon was a big favorite of mine. That's right. So, so I love all those old school gangster films. Um, and then I was really into um, the was uh, what was that one called? Uh, I was into um, Fellini quite a bit because I loved the, just the madness of it. <laughs> um, and there was a uh, Peter Greenway's. Um, uh, oh, God, what was it called? The Peter Greenway's one uh, where they feed the dinner. What was it called? Sorry. Sorry. I've, I've had half a bunch of sleep because my baby has been keeping me up all night. <laughs> Um, the cook, the thief, and her, her lover. Thank you very much. And um, and those, sorry. The cook, the thief, and her lover were um, was another one because it was so over the top visually. Was was a fantastic one. So those were the kind of movies that I really got inspired by. Then going back to David Lynch, the most the the film that I really liked, and it's one of my favorite films of all time, is actually Lost Highway. Mm. I don't know if you saw that one. It's, so it's I've, one of the... uh, I've seen most of these, and uh, and I like all of the ones I've seen. Lost Highway definitely is on among the top, I would say, for me as well. Yeah. So for me, it's the it's not the one that people talk about because people talk about like you know um, Razorhead or The Elephant Man. Those are all really good movies, but um, Lost Highway for me has so much. Like the aesthetic is probably the strongest of his movies. Um, I thought it was even better than Mulholland Drive, just simply because even the design of the sets. The, the sound of the music, the casting, like, and for me, it's such a dark story. And it's all about transformation, which I love. There's a, like a lot of depth going there. And it hadn't, it didn't become so surreal that it, there was nothing to be made out of it. It still has a, a storyline that can be followed because, you know, in his later work, when you start looking at Inland Empire, the, 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 the surreal becomes so far gone from the story that it's hard to follow. And it, it also... As, as a result of that, it, it pulls you away from engaging with the material as well. But Lost Highway had all those elements of, you know, the crime, uh, gangsters, the the woman, you know, and it's very much, um, and funny enough, I think it was Bunwell who had a very same, I'm trying to think of the name of the movie was, I think it was uh, the object of desire, object of her desire, was they changed actors in the middle. Um, and apparently there was, I think I have to, I have to Google it now just to get the name of the film because I watched so many of them. So, um, and the thing is, is that he had a problem at, and the, the story goes that he had a problem with his actress and his actress like walked off set. So instead of like trying to start the movie again, he just said, you know what, fuck it. We'll just, uh, we'll just hire a different actress, say nothing. And then just, you know, and it made the movie even more surreal. I have to Google it now, which one that is. But, um, and so he's very much, it's almost like a take. And if you look at Lynch's work, you see a lot of Bunuel and Antonioni in his work. Um, so he was clearly very inspired. Um, and those kinds of like, um, those kind of nods to the past really, you know, affected me as well. Um, there's another, another movie that a lot of people don't like called Salo. Uh, by Pasolini. Pasolini like that's a big one for me um, that movie and not because it was so graphic but just because there was so much a uh, political statement and it was his last movie as well because he was murdered not long after that um, and it's and, you know Pasolini is such an interesting character because he was a guy who was known for like, these beautiful art house religious movies and then suddenly he does that and that gets him killed <laughs> um, there was another guy who was also really um, big on my list as well is a guy called Derek Jarman. And he was a guy who died of AIDS and his last movie was called Blue. And uh, Blue was basically like monologues over a blue screen. I mean, it's like, yeah, really like, 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 I mean, it's, I mean, that's, that's basically your Japanese noise artist right there. You know what I mean? Like, you've got to <laughs> exactly. be really extreme to like that stuff. Like but noise that, that mixed was... with spoken word. No. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So I guess I guess Derek Jarman's Blue is is basically the whole back catalog of Sun, 
You know, have you ever seen that? You ever heard the band Sun? Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the yeah, it filmic sense. equivalent of that. <laughs> yeah, so well. those kinds of movies had a lot to do with my personality. And obviously I could not connect with people um, on cinema basis, because like I said, you know, typically you ask people what their favorite movie is. They say like, oh, I like Pulp Fiction or oh, I like The Godfather. And that, those are great movies. Don't get me wrong. But when your, you know, favorite movies are like, you know, Salo and like, you know, you know, uh, The Cook Thief and Her Lover, like you can't exactly, nobody asks you to pick the movie at the party. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the side effect, the, the consequence. Yeah. Um, that Bunuel that you mentioned, um, I know he has one called, I think it is The Obscure Object of Desire, but I haven't seen that one, nor, nor do I remember the... That's the one, because that's my favorite one. It's that one. Mm. So you should definitely watch it. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I surely will. It's been on my list for, for, for a while, but, uh, but, but I completely agree with, uh, with Lynch, with Lost Highway. It, it's, it's quite something. I think no one sees that movie and comes out indifferent. Like Even if they hate it or, or they love it, it will really... really um, really have an impact i think i would say for me i would say it's probably it's probably tied with eraser Red. i think those two are my favorites from from his and um you know with a lot of what you've been uh, saying you know uh, regarding cinema it seems to me that you you are really into these um like subjective psychological type of cinema like the, the type of cinema that puts you inside the mind of the characters like inside their their own reality yeah, and, and you can, like, if you were to watch one of my films, like, if you watch my most recent film, you will see a lot of that in the main character. Because the thing is, is that I'm a person who loves to study things, right? I, I get obsessed about certain things. Um, themes, and, I'm, I, and I think every great filmmaker, and not that I'm saying I'm a great filmmaker, first off, let me not say that, but I'm saying that I think great, great um, filmmakers, you can always tell that they have a they have themes or they have a, a motifs that they use that is it gets you in it's it's what you what you're drawn to the character i find my biggest problem that i have with a lot of modern cinema is it doesn't have an identity some things have a wonderful they have wonderful stories but they don't the person telling the story has no pizzazz they have nothing deeper beyond it that's my one of my problems that i have with a lot of the the independent filmmakers who perhaps you know, are perhaps lacking in that. And one of the things that I find with filmmakers like Lynch, there's a lot of his personality injected within the films, his fears. If you look at, um, there's another one called uh, Danny Boyle. I don't know if you know Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle made yeah, movies yeah. like 20 Days Later, Train Spotting. If you look at his movies, right, and he's a more mainstream filmmaker, he has a, he came from a religious family. So there's a lot of fatherly religious connotations put into to to mm -hmm. the films i mean even 28 days later i mean there's a there's a scene in the church where where the the father comes out of, but these kind of themes of coming from a christian background in in in, in, a, in a difficult part of england at the time that was difficult are very much embedded in his stories i mean that's that's kind of what his things in. and even david lynch i mean you know a razor head you mentioned the fear of youth and trying to make um and to be represented, I mean, the, 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 the child being this monster, this creation. Um, it's very interesting how, and you know, I would, have, I would have loved to sort of meet David Lynch at that time, because I wouldn't doubt that that is based on some form of reality it happened to him. Now, obviously it might have not, I don't know if he had children that, I don't know enough about that part of his life, but I'm sure that if you go further back enough, you will find that that was something that was very, a fear of his because he puts a lot of the fearful things of, of his reality in his films. And what's really interesting is, is the juxtaposition of these fearful things that happen, like, like in Blue Velvet, we have like this, this violence, this aggression, this guy, and yet with the calmness and tranquility of what looks like the, the area around, it's these kinds of tones that you always, you can always tell you're watching a Lynch movie. Yes, um, definitely. It's like Scorsese's as well. Scorsese's movies, they have a feel, they have a tone, it's the music, it's the way the camera moves. It's its the the timing that when you see these stories that unravel, like it's just the way he tells his stories. You can tell straight away, it's Scorsese. And so for me, when I put my movies, I put a lot of myself into the movies. So that they tend to be a lot of, a lot of the themes are inheritance. It's, it's, it's expectation. It's also like, 
trying to live up to expectation. Those are the common themes that you'll find in my movies. Now, if you go to the main character in my movie, my last movie, The Green Sea, she's a former heavy metal musician who was successful with her first book, but can't seem to finish her second book. So it's the fear of trying to make, you know, to the expectation of having more success because we live in a fast moving world where success to say, you're only as good as your last book. So there's the fear of trying to, to repeat success. And at the same time, the, 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 um, the theme, or not the theme, the, um, the image of the movie is a turtle. And if you look at my life, I'm a, I'm a person who has to carry this big legacy and all this heritage on my back. So it's a metaphor for the, for the animal, the turtle. So the whole movie is, is, is an entire, entire storyline built on metaphor. And the writer, she's fixing her own world through imagination because what the film is about is she's a writer and one of her characters comes to life in the movie and helps her deal with her trauma and essentially move on to her next possibility because she's being held back by the past and it's only until that it's it's basically her creativity that will save her in the end and that's what the movie is about but those are very deep themes that's not what you you pay 10 bucks to see at the cinema straight away i mean that's not for everybody that's some that's some deep shit right there <laughs> so you know i mean and using this the obscure world world of imagination blending into the real into the real world is is what i'm really interested in i love that crossing between crossing between reality and, and perception of reality and i think if you look at lynch's films and a lot of these other sort of surrealist type filmmakers you will see they're it, obviously each one has their own unique style but you see that there's a lot of blending between our perceived realities and what what actions happen and even if you look out out your window and you were to like really just look at the world in its, in its truest sense um you'll probably find that there are things in the and, and and cause and effects that happen that don't make a lot of sense in our society between people and and, and things you add a bit of so seasoning to that and you have a movie <laughs> okay, so um You've already talked um, uh, a lot about the themes of your latest movie, but I was also going to ask you if, um, for those who are listening to us and are unfamiliar, um, can you talk a little bit more about like the um, the style of the film, the feel, like what can what can they expect from the Green Sea at that level? So we used a lot of uh, Invictus Records was a uh, was a very very helpful part of the movie because Invictus Records put out some bands that allowed us to use their music in the movie because mm -hmm. I wanted, you know, I'm a metalhead. The, the lead character, by the way, is, is Catherine Isabel from the film Ginger Snaps. Now she's perceived typically as a, as, you know, a horror queen and she's always beautiful in this. Movie. I wanted to make her a movie that she wasn't beautiful. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wanted to make her like, uh, like that movie monster, you know, unattractive. Uh, I wanted her to be an absolute bitch. And in the movie, she's almost to the point where she's almost on, unlikable because she's so extremely bitchy um and so she's a metalhead she's she's got death metal t-shirts she's but we're not trying to make it some like i didn't try and create something that was like i say a caricature so although she has got all those aspects of her personality it's not what that movie is about it's more like the dressing so what you're going to find in that movie is 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 there's a lot of ambience the music is is it's got a lot of variations because we use a lot of heavy metal but we also use a lot of sort of ambient um drone music creates the persona of the character who is a flawed character like she's a she's a person who has a lot of trauma and her trauma manifests in in these visual visual things in, in including producing these characters from her imagination or you know that's at least what we perceive in the film but the movie it's not a clear-cut movie it's it's a movie that very much it's about interpretation so people going in there to, to expecting everything's going to be fed to them. It's not that kind of movie. You know, if you like Lynch movies, then you might enjoy it. But if you're looking for a, a simple movie that has, that has, you know, everything handed to you, uh, that's predictable, then perhaps it's not for you. Okay. And um, I also want to bring up something that this is something that I actually, um, I talk a lot about this on this podcast, which is, uh, going back to to the music, to the to extreme metal and heavy metal, I think a, char a characteristic that that genre has that um, you know, I think it's very unique. It's it's something that not much music has it, which is 
I think uh, extreme metal also has a lot of world building to it, like the the artwork, the the lyrics, the the imagery. Like you put a lot of people usually say that the the impression they get is when they put on the album, they feel like they're transported. They are like um, there's this effect of immersion. Uh, if you listen to like Marvin Angel, you know those those lyrics, those like mythological lyrics and the music, it really makes you feel like you're in a, another dimension and. Uh, so was this, do you think this was part of the appeal as well for you? Absolutely, because, you know, the thing is, right, um, these kinds of art, and I use the word artists because they are actually artists, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot, it's more than just playing a few power chords and growling into a microphone, right? You're building an aesthetic, you, you know, I mean, you look at stuff like the the black metal aesthetic. I mean, it's it's very, one could look at it uh, and just laugh at it a bit and say it's a more extreme version of Kiss. But there's a whole kind of like the artwork, the design, the ambience, the way it's produced, all of that kind of music lends itself to an emotional state. And I, I mean, I don't know if not all your listeners probably even like that kind of music, but the thing is, it has an aesthetic to it. Even death metal has the same. It has a different, slightly more savage kind of aesthetic. Um, these things are... are like they they give you a lot of ideas when you listen to them. I find them because there's the time signatures. The you're listening to walls of sound. What I find is very difficult for me to appeal to is when I listen or I I view things that perhaps relate to an everyday kind of circumstance. I find that I'm less able. Like you know, a lot of people like mainstream music, and there's nothing wrong. There's a lot of very talented artists there. But the problem that I find is the generic uh, mainstream. Like what's that guy called? The uh, the what is popular today, when I listen to it, it makes me almost want to vomit because the thing is, it's so, it so lacks any kind of depth, you know, and I'm not saying that, that dying fetus has so much depth, but what I'm saying is that dying fetus has moods, has, has technical ability. You're, you, when you listen to a band like dying fetus, you get those chuggy riffs and then these extreme, like, uh, uh, you know, solos and stuff like that. You're getting, you're getting a barrage of ideas. And then with these very deep guttural vocals, and then you go to something like, you know, like, uh, ISIS, for example, now ISIS, the band, not ISIS, you know, and you, you, everything has this very sort of organic, almost like, um, water-like feel you know it almost feels like you're at the ocean you know you're seeing landscapes and saw so it's this it's their sense of scale you don't get that in 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 popular music you know i find that you know exactly. you get hook you get hooks what that's what's the difference it's the same with movies you get something that is a hook yeah i can sing along to it on the radio i can bounce my head in my car but what you don't get is that scale of stuff like when you listen to something like Neurosis, for example, it's it's the ambiance of the whole build. It's the dynamics of changes, and it's the mounting uh, wall of sound. You know, people could uh, could say that that's what you get from bands like Pink Floyd. You know, it's for me when I listen to something like Pink Floyd. Now, personally speaking, it's not that I really like Pink Floyd, but they do something very similar. They build up a, a scale. They build up a a, a mountain of, of 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 sounds and creations. And much, I just don't get anything from that because perhaps it's not, doesn't connect with me the same way that let's say I would get from Cult of Luna or, you know, something like Burzum or, or you know, Dark Throne. And, and I'm no way comparing that, that, uh, that deep, per, um, deep purple, that, um, that, that those things are, are the same. They're not. But what I mean is that it connects with me and it connects to that, that primal side of my brain. And in those kind of scales of things like that help create thought patterns. And I think the problem is with a lot of more mainstream stuff, it creates a generic pattern because you are, you are surging with your brain certain patterns that are easy, that are, they don't require, they, they are comfortable, they keep you in a very mellow state. But when you listen to anything that's, that's on either side of the scale, whether it's extreme or it's minimalist, I think you'll find that you'll, on either side of the scale, you will find, you know, I'm sure people get this from classical music as well. Um, and I find that the, I'm um, obviously all the heavy metal stuff is on one side and the, and, you know, then you go to jazz and, and classical on the other, everything in between is probably what I call the mush and you'll probably get less fruit from the mush, but you'll definitely get some, 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 some black berries of hell from, from, from the dark side. And you'll probably get, you know, white berries of beauty on the classical music side. 
but you know, if you listen to Britney Spears, probably you're not going to write the greatest films ever, and you're probably not going to have the greatest profound thoughts either. You know what I mean? It's another one thing that I didn't bring in, which I don't mind. I know I'm talking a lot, but one of the things that I would also say, life experience. Because one thing I've noticed with with a lot of uh, those more extreme artists is they have a, a lot of flaws in their personalities. If you look at some of the more like cr the crazier of minds, there are a lot of them are very flawed people. They've suffered. Suffering brings out the greatest amounts of art. It's the same in literature. If you look at someone like, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people don't like him these days because of uh, some of the things he said in life, but Lovecraft. Lovecraft, uh, for me, I, I, I think Lovecraft is, is, is brilliant. Um, but the thing like is, and I don't well. care, I don't care about what he said in life. I only look at Lovecraft for his work only. And that's the only yeah. thing I'm interested in. Like yeah, it's the sure. same. I, I always separate the artist from the music or from the from the the words. Yeah, uh, I don't I won't I won't shoot my plumber or rip out my plumbing because the my plumber went to jail for scamming someone. You know what I mean? It's not it's not the same. But Lovecraft or any of these great, great minds, he suffered a lot. Like, you know, it took yeah, a yeah. lot of suffering to get those ideas out and when i so i listen to music from people who have suffered you know and if you look at doom or you look at these kinds of music a lot of these people are, are have had a hard life they've had suffering and i'm not saying that there's not and their their music reflects that suffering and that i think gives it a certain amount of beauty the rage the 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 pain those are things that i myself identify with and those things are you know fuel my creativeness and if you go to these things where people are talking about like, you know, kissing boys at bars or, you know, you know, they kissed a girl and, and I liked it or, or some bullshit like that, that, that Katy Perry is saying, there's nothing there. I, I don't feel those. I, I don't feel those emotions. And I suppose that's one of the things that I think the people who can maybe relate to those things and get a lot out of them perhaps aren't really going to understand, you know, the, the things that I'm talking about. Um, and I think those people, you know, I don't think David Lynch is ever going to listen to Katy Perry either. You know what I mean? But well, it's needs, those fun it's fact: those he did use Ramstein on Lost Highway, right? Yeah. I remember that. It was a, it was a great bit of the stuff. But actually, that's a great sequence because he comes in and and there's a Ramstein and he's he's going there and his nose is bleeding and he's walking down that red red corridor, yeah. and he's opening up doors to his consciousness. Right? He opens up one door yeah, and, yeah, exactly. and he's the girl having sex. I mean, you know, that's, you know, his, the demons are coming out of his mind and that's, what's really cool. I love that. That's why I think that movie is so underrated and it's a shame he doesn't get more credit for that one because everybody talks about Mulholland Drive, which certainly seems a little bit more accessible, but for me, it has nowhere near the ability of depth, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it's the pain and suffering that, that, that will really release an artist. Uh, and look, like I said, you can paint and suffer and then make indie music. And I, I get it. But it's, I suppose, when it comes to art, it's it's that pain and suffering that's almost essential if you really want to do something deep. Because I think if your day is, is bland, if your your biggest problem is whether you got lunch on time or not, I think your your music is gonna be bullshit. Uh, you know, it's 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 the it's the it's the rises and falls that 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 create those those scars. And that's the thing. You know, scars is is what defines you. You know, the more trauma and stuff like that, and and disappointments you endure, the more you have to write about. <laughs> well, I I really agree with uh, with all that you said. And uh, going back to the question of um, like uh, heavy metal and world building, really, I agree. Also, um, I think it makes a lot of sense that some someone like you is drawn to to creating stories and telling stories, uh, it makes uh, creating environments so as well. I think it makes sense that you that you you also find this side of the music appealing because indeed, uh, like you said, you know, pop music is in a, if you look at most people, you know, uh, today, their experience of listening to music is really passive. It's almost like an injection of, of dopamine, right, L right into the brain, like a chemical injection. But a lot of the I think the best uh, of metal albums they really have this effect where if you try to do this exercise, for example, of like listening to the album with eyes closed and trying to like imagine the, the landscapes, uh, I think a lot of albums are really good for that. And I think you it, you, you talked about some examples. I, I think another really great example would be for uh, like in the Night Side Eclipse by Birds, by Emperor. That album oh, really yeah. has, you know, they, they really create a wall like um, 
the whole universe, like these entities and these um, all of these drama that's going on. It's I think it's really an excellent album in that sense. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and another thing to to add, um, I told you earlier that I was into hi-fi, right? That I spent a lot of time trying to get the perfect mm -hmm. sound. It's interesting that you brought up what you brought up because the object of hi-fi, the, the concept of why we do it as, as audiophiles is we get closer to the music, right? Mm -hmm. By hearing more details, by hearing the more nuances of the, of the music. Because when you listen to something in a car radio, you hear the music, but you don't hear as much as you think you're hearing. Yeah. And when you put something on in a, a big system and you hear it, you're hearing, you can hear the room, you can hear the, the ambient sounds that you might not have heard before. There was, I was listening to some music and I heard that in one track, there was a, a, like a small amount of rain in the, in the mix that I never heard before. It's only when I put on like a slightly better pair of speakers that suddenly I could hear these little details. But that's what I think. And, and when it comes to world building, that's why I suppose that I, I resonate so much with trying to get as close to the music as possible because it's, it's, like, it's like fuel. And the more you can get the pure fuel into your brain, because like I said, when you sit down and you listen to music, because I sit down and I listen to music, just like when I sit down and I watch a movie, I sit down and I watch the film. I'm not sitting on Facebook, watching a movie or checking on my phone, because that's, does, that's passive. I don't do that. Um, I still buy my movies on, on DVD and Blu-ray, because again, the concept of me buying something, I put my value into it. Somebody made an, uh, they made an artwork. They, they took time to do something of, of benefit. I put it in, I'm giving it a, a proper, uh, if you like, I am, it's, it's not that I, I so love the idea that we have to have things, but I, I have, uh, firstly, I voted for something that I want. I want people to make movies. So I want people to, and it's the same with music. I want people to sell me an album that has a CD because I want to be able to purchase that, show my love for the artist. But also when I put it in, I'm making a commitment. The I'm not going to passively listen to this. I will listen to music, of course, like anybody at the gym while I'm working, while I'm driving. But when I sit down and I listen, and that's the most important time for me because that's when I work. And I'm sitting there and I write. The first thing that I do is I put the CD on. Now, I put the music, whether it's a CD or a vinyl or whatever, put the CD on and I get the tone that I'm going to write the scene. So I will sit there and write, I'm going to write a romantic scene or I'm going to write a scene where it's going to be hazy and the guy is going to kiss a girl, for example, right? Now I can't put on, uh, you know, um, I'm probably not going to put on uh, immolation while, while I'm going to have an ambient romance scene. Probably not. I might put in some shoegaze. Or I might put in something that's going to have, that's going to help me create the, the, almost the visual style in my mind. I can see the pictures, the glides between the cuts. Where immolation comes in is the rest. Like when I'm sitting there and like we're creating the monster, that's when the immolation goes on. You know, that's when, when I'm going to want to listen to today is the day. When, when there's like psychosis happening, you know what I mean? There's a great album called uh, Temple, of the Morning, uh, Temple of the Morning Star. Temple of the Morning Star or Temple of the Morning Sun by Today is the Day. Uh, one of the great albums for me, because I grew up with that album when I was about 18. And it was just, for me, it was all about, like I was smoking a lot of weed back then. And I was, you know, I was living in a, in a town. Everything was going wrong. I was an angry teenager. And, uh, you know, I didn't have shit. Was crap at college, you know. Didn't know what I was doing, trying to score with skater chicks at the park. And yet it was that that kind of like living in a dead end town kind of sound that was just gave me so much. And it was a lot of those kind of like noise core bands that I really liked. Another Imagine one was that uh, Godflesh would probably fit very well there as well. Godflesh fits very well there. And uh, there was another band, Rabies Cased, and, uh, and another band called Unsane that I was really into as well. You know, these are like, you know, basically anything that Relapse has ever done. <laughs> So, so those things, so those ideas, and that's why I think there's the importance of trying to be closer to music. Because another thing I will say, right, I find that heavy metal is there's the, the, the fan base is more attracted to go see live shows than the average. Because, you know, it, when we go and see a performance where we're getting injected with this visceral energy, right? Yeah. You, you know, it's not that you can't get that from other, other performance, but let's be honest. I don't ever hear about people going to see Boyzone or, or, or those kinds of bands, those, those pop bands, and having the same visceral effect. 
you know, not all of them. I'm, I'm sure people get it, got it from Michael Jackson. I'm sure people got it from whoever, Britney Spears, maybe. But it's not the same, you know. And that's why, for me, things like we were talking about Roadburn, why those kinds of occasions are so important. Because in when I go to Roadburn, I'm there to listen. That's all. I'm not going out and I'm not getting pissed and falling asleep in a tent. I'm there to listen to music. And every time I come from Roadburn, I come back and I will guarantee you the next week I am producing the most amount of work because that has a has all my ideas. I literally go to Roadburn with a notebook to make notes because I'm sitting there. I'm listening to something that's euphoric or, or something that's psychedelic. And I'm thinking I'm thinking ideas. Ideas are happening. Formulations. And I'm not taking any drugs. I'm just I'm the music, you know. Yeah, that can also can, can be quite a drug as well. The, the music. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it can so, be just as uh, expensive if you start buying vinyls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the downside. So uh, we've talked a lot about the influence of music on your work. Um, but uh, I was also thinking about, for example, the, um, the natural surroundings where you've been, you, you've been raised. Um, I imagine that the, being exposed to that, it also must foster a sense of wonder. Uh, you know, in the face of nature, the, I, I think that's also very important for for art and for creativity. You know, being being sensible to beauty, to natural beauty. Do you also feel that, or do you feel that that is important? So, yeah. So uh, let me explain because I have a I have a, a deep thought on this. Habitat. You are way. You know, if you stay in a place, eventually you become that place. That's I've always said that. And uh, habitat has a lot to do with it. You know. You, when you live in a place, you're inspired by it. Whether you like it or not, you're, you're seeing the same things, those ideas, those connections are being made, whether you're passively making those connections or not. So if you were to look at some of my films, and I didn't always live where I lived, you'll see there's massive, more and more nature and environmental stuff is being important. And for those listeners who don't really know anything about me, I am, um, apart from being a filmmaker and, and being this... this um, I inherited this massive medieval estate and I decided that I was going to try and rewild the estate. Now, to people who don't know what that means, I basically am trying to rewild the area. By I took all the animal agriculture off. I started planting trees. I was creating forests. I was creating worlds, if you like. And, and that aspect, but that's my surroundings. That's what I'm seeing every day. I'm seeing animals return. And then on top of that, I'm being influenced by the music I listen to, the films I watch, the books I read. This has become my world. And so if you watch my work, you will see a heavy influence of, of environment, of nature. And the characters are always these small little beings amongst these big trees and these big atmosphere, these big landscapes. The way I shoot movies tends to be quite large scale. I like, or they're very claustrophobic where you're in the dark, but you're in small spaces. Um, these are the aspects. So, and, and what makes of what makes music interesting, but what also makes film interesting is dynamic changes to black to white. You know, these are, and it's the same with, with, with music where you go the highs and the lows, right? If you, everything is the same or, and you'll know this because there's a lot of those bands that are less interesting that if you look at the production, if you look at the sound waves, they've been sandwiched. Everything is what we call sausage, right? Everything looks like a sausage, but the best stuff is when there's a lot of dynamic changes you know, ups and downs and, and, and quiet bits and loud bits. It just, from a from an ear perspective, it's, mu it's musically more interesting naturally. And it's the same with film. When you go from very dark moments to, to these beautiful aspects, you it, it gives the dark moments even more value, if you like. And if everything's too dark, you know, you eventually become used to it. And that's it. It's just, that's what it is. It's, it becomes sausage, as I put it. <laughs> Um, so it's creating these, these, it's like Caravaggio was, was a very in, interesting painter. And he created this, this be beautiful thing called chiaroscuro, which is a, an artistic style where you contrast darkness with light. Bright lights across very dark um, points. And that creates this very dynamically interesting uh, style to his work, which which become very popular in cinema and in I think everything. I think if you go down the the record shop, you will see a lot of influence from uh, Carva or Caroscuro. Um, and then the more extreme version of that was something called Tenebrism, which was even darker amounts of black, where things are black and then very sort of. And Tenebrism is, I suppose, the the equivalent of 
of the slam death metal gore grind. You know, what I mean, it's it, it's not nothing newer. It's just a bit more extreme than the last. You know, what I mean, it's 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 just pigs squealing all the way, and then and then lots of thuds. <laughs> It, you know, but but it's still cool, but it is what it is, right? And so, but Karaskuro creates that ambience of darkness. And so having the ambience of the nature of this beautiful backdrop of po poetic large trees, then you you come to a, uh, the darkness of my office where I create these dark storylines, where I listen to obscure music and I have this darkness in the stories and then contrasting them against these beautiful landscapes. You see it a lot in my movies and that's, one of the things that I personally find fascinating in films, I like to see that. I want beauty, but I also want the devil. Yeah, very interesting. We once again we we are led back to David Lynch, the like like you said in Blue Velvet or Twin Peaks, the contrast between the light and the dark. Um, yeah. And I'm also glad that you brought up the Yori Wildling project because I was going to talk about that, but now that you did it, uh, yeah, I'm glad you did it and. I also take the chance to congratulate you on that. I think it's a really interesting and really uh, beneficial project. And Thank you. I've also read that um, it's been quite controversial that you've gotten death threats and everything, uh, but you still keep at it. And I, I would say that's a pretty metal attitude, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you. So I did the, what, what your viewers or listeners have to have to understand is I live in a traditional place uh, and Ireland has a problem with the aristocracy traditionally because of the history of Ireland. Uh, so already from day one, I would be unlike no matter what I did. And the area that I live is a very high quality agricultural place. And they have traditions for horse hunting. You know, those guys in red jackets who chase foxes. You probably don't have that in Portugal, but they definitely have it in a lot of places. And you see those, those what I want to call the, the wannabe English brigade going around in their, in their red stupid jackets and their dogs and also poachers and stuff like that. Now, when I took over, this place was full. There was poachers, there were these guys and they did what they wanted. They come, they intimidated, they got away with murder because they were the ones who had the money. They were the elite. And the ironic thing is people presume that because I come from a place like this, that I would be on the horse. Well, no, uh, I don't believe in those people, those people, and just because uh, you're from the aristocracy doesn't necessarily make you a jerk, but there's a good chance you're probably a jerk anyway uh, from the aristocracy. So I completely understand why people don't like the aristocracy. I don't like the aristocracy. But that having been said, I decided that that was the end because we are, you know, we are, I'm a guy who spends a lot of time thinking about the past because I'm not an owner of this estate. That's not how I see it. I'm a caretaker of history. My job is to protect the history, protect the, the the sacrifices that others have made, add a few uh, of my own, and then pass it on so things can be remembered. So our point of view will forever be part of our history. That's that's how I look at it. That's done through protection, the, the building, the artwork, the, the legacy of others. But one thing that has always been forgotten in, in my culture, and in many cultures, is the environment. Because to be perfectly honest with you, Nothing I do or you do means anything without our natural heritage, which is our true lifeline. And without sounding like a hippie, we are children of, of, of this land. You know what I mean? And we treat this land with no respect. So one of the things that I wanted to embrace with rewilding is protecting the environment, the natural heritage of my country. Because the truth is, people like me were once wearing armor and fighting and they were knights and all that stuff now none of that bullshit means anything today but there was a duty that came with that the duty was to protect the people and defend defend the land from tyranny now nobody needs any protection from me in this day and age but what the land still does because the land is being exploited by by bad men and it takes it where my 900 years of relatives have fought for it has nothing has changed. The only difference is they don't try and cut my head off with an axe. Now they just try and shoot me. <laughs> and that's the thing. And yeah, absolutely. I have gone and I gone to war with these people. And I said, no, there will be no more of that. We will defend what is ours. We will defend the wild. So I created this rewilding project. Um, and it's the only one in Ireland. And bear in mind, I did it for nothing. 
uh, I paid for everything myself. I, I was, my, my family was losing about a hundred thousand a year when we started. And then I took away 25% of my income. That would be crazy, but you have to understand that this was not a beyond, this was beyond my life. This was the future, our future, our people, you know? And I said to myself, I just have to work harder and make it. And, and, you know, it's not enough, you know, I could try and survive or I could really do something crazy here and make a change. And I did make a change. And you know what? I'm not losing a hundred thousand every year. Things are things I got better, but it took sacrifice. It's seven days a week for me to pay. I work four jobs to pay for all of this stuff. I've never taken a penny. And the idea was my rewilding project is pure. There's no bullshit. I'm not selling, I'm not selling pony rides. There's no, I'm not selling you any hamburgers. There's no petting zoo. And there's you can fuck off for the with your yoga. There's none of that bullshit. What you have here is true, true wild, as close as I could make it. There's forests, there's animals. And the only thing I do do is I protect the animals because um, what we do here is there's an animal hospital nearby and I take the animals when, they've, when they're not critically ill. I look after them and then I release them back into the wild. So what I've created here is an oasis, an oasis of nature and time. Um, it's really important because creativity, art and heritage are very important. Like we don't always like the past but we should always respect the past for what it is. And our environment is unfortunately something that we have not respected for so long, but there's no excuse we don't fix it today. So that's what I said eight years ago, I started doing this thing. I've had a window shot out. I've had people try to slash my tires. I've had a guy threaten to cut me a Chelsea smile, which for your listeners who don't know what that is, that means they cut your cheeks from here to here and they make your face open. Ouch. I've had a guy do that. I've threatened to be beaten up. I've had vandalism on my property. My my father had fire, set fire on things. And you know what? Ten. I'm still here eight years later. And the only way they're going to get rid of me is if they actually shoot me. So they're going to have to shoot me. But And then I hope that my family will raise another one and they will take over the job because then nothing has changed in, in 900 years. We've been here. We're the oldest family in Ireland. 900 years we've been here. And you know what? Nothing different. 900 years ago, they were trying to cut our heads off. In 2021, they just rather shoot them off, you know? But that's the thing. It, the world needs people to stand up. And people like me were born with privilege. And we have the privilege to serve. That's how I see it. Very, very interesting. And this also has a very curious aspect, I think, which is that, well, in a sense, what you're doing is, with your rewilding project, um, sort of restoring the natural order, right? And this is a very, I think this is a very powerful theme, like in all of art and literature. I'm thinking, for example, um, like in the early uh, stages of industrialization and the big cities, you know, there were the many of those uh, great poets like William Blake, they really resisted the, um, this urbanization and they, and they turned to, the, to nature, the, like the romantic movement in general, that is a great affinity with nature, with like returning to, to the innocence, to the, um, to the primordial state. And the, the funny thing is, I think some of these actually uh, made its way to metal. For example, you know, with black metal, there's a lot of, uh, like the Norwegian black metal, it has this aspect of the, you know, the hatred of the, um, of the human environment and the cities and the, the return to the forest. And, um, or even like Godflesh, which you already mentioned, um, you know, these really uh, abrasive, these re re really uh, disturbing, like uh, industrial environment, which it, it makes you see, uh, see it for what it is. Uh, so do you, what do you think of this connection? I 100% think that if you're, you know, the, the thing is with those guys who are interested in those things, you know what I find is when I meet people, it, it's interesting because the people that are interested in what I do, um, they're interested a lot because I do the wild stuff. And if you look at that, a lot of people who are into subversive alternative culture tend to be more, should we say, open to these kinds of ideas. They're more open to, to the wild. They're more open to in the environment. And I find that, you know, there is an emphasis on that. Now, obviously, we were talking about Godflesh and we were talking about, you know, Norwegian black metal. Now, they're products of their environment. If you go to, I've been to Norway. And if you go to Norway, you fly in from, from to, to uh, Oslo. The first thing you see is trees and trees and trees. You know, the one, you, you don't have to like Norwegian black metal, but you can at least understand that 
from a culture point of view, they're nationalists about their land. You know, they a lot of them were were sort of comparing themselves to Vikings and stuff like that. But they were very much they're very proud of where they come from, and they have this pride. You know, and if you go to Norway, you'll see that there's a reason for it because I mean, Norway is great. Like it's everything's clean, it's beautiful, and you know, so they have a lot of uh, pride over their place, where they come from, their history. And, you know, there's problems that can come with pride. Then you can get into into extreme nationalism and stuff like that. But that's that's not what we're talking about here today. But the thing is, is that there's this pride. And I think when you're creating something that's then you're getting so much uh, you pull from your environment. And when you get so much from that, you are also protective of it. You know, in Godflesh's case, if you look at Justin, Justin came from, you know, uh, difficult part. I mean, a lot of it is also urban sounding. You know what I mean? Justin does a lot with electronic stuff because he came from an urban background. You know, so so you see a lot of the, the where they come from is very much embedded in their in their identities and musical identities as well as artistic and identities. And you know, there is a rejection to to essentially what is um, invading your 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 state, your your place. And I think with in Blake's case. Um, you found that they were they were fighting the the chain the winds of change that was this urbanization, and I think you know in a way in a, in, a, in a one could make an argument that very much that was also what was happening in those scenes like the the black metal scene where they were very much using the the their forests as 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 part of their their palette um, because that's where they were They're, those places were. You know, there wasn't a lot going on in those places, and and they were only, you know, they were people like I said to you that had trauma, that had pain, and they 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 could manifest themselves in their own world. They were world building, and I thought, you know, what's more more impressive than to be king of the woods? You know what I mean? To wear a big cape and sing through a skull, you know. But yeah, that's I the thing. We, we go back to imagination, and the thing is, is I think if you cultivate imagination you you can get lost in it really easily and it's it's an amazing thing and it's an amazing experience for anybody who is creative or even someone who is artistic in any way is to really embrace your your imagination and just get lost in it that's why i have a lot of i love guys who are or girls who tell me they're into role playing because that's that's like a you know i don't do it by the way but people who do it it's it, it's it's doing that getting lost in creativity on a really raw sense and some people do it through through escapism, through music or film or whatever. And other people do it for drugs. But I mean, that's the thing is, is that we're all looking for that level of escapism. And, and, and the environment is truly one of the best places to do it. Yeah, I agree. 100%. Uh, um, OK, I think we've gone through quite a lot of um, topics. I think we've been more or less. Uh, of course, there will be more stuff to talk about, but uh, I think I will make uh, one last question, which is um, kind of a joke because I've, I've seen from, from your comments that uh, this is not really your style of filmmaking. But anyway, uh, would you ever consider making a big budget adaptation of one of the books by Lord Dansaini? You know what? If you had asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said no. Uh, I would, I mean, I would have said yes, because they would have paid me money, but I would have said no, because I wouldn't want to. But nowadays, do you know what is the most pure, you know, the, the to be able to em, embrace some, someone who is a genius's work, and be able to really just try and compliment it, would be an honor. And I would think, you know what, I absolutely would. And you know, if you had to ask me which one I would love to do, I would say Don Rodriguez is and he's a swashbuckling guy because I love I love a bit of sword fighting and I want to see I want to see there's a lot of potentiality for a swashbuckling Lord Dunsany adaption with me directing it but I I also loved um, no you know Elfland would have been cool but I think I think for me it would have been Don Rodriguez you know and I you know and that's the thing with scale really doesn't matter too much as long as the themes of the, what you're doing can really last because I've seen some, I've seen a lot of trash in those big budget movies, but I've seen some real hidden gems. And, and the thing is, is that I think with, with all those things, if, if there's an honest theme, if the subtext is there and there's some depth, doesn't matter what, what that is Hollywood or not. The problem that I think is being lost in, in both in, in the creative industry in general, on uh, in the, the mainstream and the large scale 
is that we are sacrificing hooks, you know, catchy stuff, stuff that we can put in a trailer for depth, for character study. Because you know what it is, people, it's a it's a fast, it's a fast food market. Now we want we want results. We want it to be quick. We want it 90 minutes and we want everybody to go in and buy their their popcorn and coke. Well, we don't even do that anymore because nowadays everybody just watches it at home. But that's the problem. When when you sacrifice, it's it's like it's like when like having a good hook. Um, when you sacrifice the the depth of storytelling for for cheap hooks and cheap bells and whistles, it's like horror does this a lot. How many horror movies have you seen where every time we are about to open a door, we get a boom? It's like it's so generic now that it's not even entertaining anymore because I'm hoping that they would try something different that we can kind of. That's why for me, when I look at horror movies, I love the kind of horrors that I'm not really expecting. I don't know what to make of them. They're slow moving. There's like something building very slowly under the surface. And I don't know. And I'm not expecting a quick scare or something to jump at me at the window because those are too obvious for me now. They don't have the same effect that they did when I was. 14 years old but the ones that get me are the ones that are really like you know oh my god i don't know what's going on you know you know that's slow and that ambient that i'm where i'm being absorbed in the atmosphere and i think if if i was a, if i could i would try and put that into the the high budget as much as possible that would be what i'd fight for well who knows maybe one day we'll have um lord dancing uh cinematic universe yeah <laughs> <laughs> And, well, then, think, and then we'll, have, we'll, the have, material, a, we'll have a pretty extreme uh, soundtrack for sure. First of all, I think the, the material is there, right? Because like we said in the beginning, he was really um, a pioneer in terms of, you know, this, this enterprise of creating uh, an entire like pantheon, an entire universe, right? Yeah. He has uh, actually 52 novels and about over two and a half thousand pieces of work. Wow. I actually, I know I'll tell you something funny, place. unlike me, and, and that's why I know he's a genius and I'm not, right? He never wrote a second draft. He always wow. wrote everything he ever wrote was first draft. And everything I wrote is has had at least 30 drafts. So there's the big difference. <laughs> I see. Okay, so I'm going to ask if you want to, to have any closing remarks, anything else you want to say to our listeners? Well, I would like to say keep your music heavy. If, you have, if you're bored, you can go and watch my movie. And um, most importantly, I think it's it's the most joyful thing is being able to express yourself whether you're an artist you're a, a filmmaker a musician so go out there and create because even if you don't get instant success it's worth doing um it's we're all a, we're all part of a world we're a tapestry and we all get a piece of that tapestry if we want it that's what i think it's important and i think for anyone creative it's not a it's not necessarily the people who have the most means who 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 succeed it's the people who are consistent And so for anyone trying to create something, anyone being inspired, you know, support the artist, but also, you know, add to the art yourself. Who cares if it's good, as long as you are honest with what you're creating. Okay, so once again, thank you a lot for, for this moment. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you so much again for, for my, your patience. <laughs>